Well, we were very pleased that the FDA uh, made a decision for accelerated approval for aducanumab on June 7th. Um, and basically what that says is that they base that on the ability of the drug to lower amyloid plaques with the likely benefit uh, on uh, clinical functioning. And this accelerated approval has been used for many other diseases. It's the first time for Alzheimer's disease, but it helps open a field while further study is done on this class of medicine. So here the class is uh, our antibodies that lower amyloid plaque. And they also, soon after making that announcement, they um, gave the green light for uh, potential approval for two other antibodies in this class. One is called denanumab made by Lilly and the other one is lecanumab made by ASI. And so those may be submitted in the next year or so to the FDA for accelerated approval as well. So we're hoping that, you know, we have one drug now that's approved and we're hoping there'll be others to follow soon. And, um, and what we've done is a group of experts or seven dementia experts, many of us who've had experience using aducanumab for a number of years in uh, clinical research um, to try to give practical guidance to clinicians on how to select patients and how to uh, use the drug in clinical practice. And so those were published a couple of weeks ago, and we hope those will be helpful to clinicians. We were very happy that the FDA initially gave very broad approval for aducanumab for Alzheimer's disease. And they narrowed that. I think they got some feedback that that was too broad. Since we only studied it for people with early Alzheimer's disease, they narrowed the indication for people with early Alzheimer's, mild cognitive impairment and mild dementia. And I think that was a wise move since we don't have data for any other stage of Alzheimer's. The guidelines that we put forward are based on the clinical trial experience and uh, people have an early stage of Alzheimer's. They, uh, we are recommending that everyone have amyloid testing right now. That's either with spinal fluid or an amyloid PET scan to show that they're building up plaques since the medicine is designed to lower the plaques. We don't wanna treat people who don't have that problem. Um, and that's gonna be a challenge, uh, accessing those tests. Right now in the United States, <clears throat> Medicare does not cover um, and provide insurance coverage for amyloid PET. We're hoping they will revise that uh, coverage decision so it does become available because we really need that test. Um, and then we're working very actively at many centers around the world to develop blood tests to get the same information about plaque buildup. So I think that's going to be much more economical and widely available. And um, so we need to move forward um, with that expeditiously to get those into the clinic. Um, so patients, and then the FDA also was quite broad and, and had very few contraindications. And we tried to give some guidance about that, that you know patients need to have an MRI scan prior to starting on treatment, and there should be an exclusion for vascular disease in the brain if there's evidence of macro hemorrhage or more than four micro hemorrhages, um, if there's significant stroke, um, that would, those people are probably not good candidates for the medicine. So screening for that. Um, we also have no information about treating people who are on anticoagulants on blood thinners. And we recommend it at least at this point until we do have more information that those patients be excluded as well. Uh, we gave guidance about dosing 
uh, which again, pretty much follows the clinical trials that we build up gradually on the dose uh, over a period of months. Uh, we slightly revised the MRI monitoring from what the FDA recommended in line again with the incidence of ARIA, which is the most common side effect. Um, so we recommend in getting an M a safety MRI scan after the three milligram dose is complete before going to six milligrams per kilogram. And then um, I'm trying to get the second one, I think was before the 10 milligrams. And then after three doses of uh, 10 milligrams. So to try to detect ARIA early and so that if a dose adjustment is needed, it can be made. We've started using the drug. Uh, so a number of centers um, have started using it in clinical practice. The main thing that we have a lot of interest, a lot of patients around the U.S. would like to get this medicine. The main thing holding people up is uh, uncertainty about coverage from their provider, from Medicare and other providers. And so we're not sure what the patient obligation will be. And so that's holding people up. I know this is very controversial because the data is a little uncertain for aducanumab, but um, I think the FDA made a wise decision. I think their intent was to move the field forward, to accelerate drug development, to provide medicine to patients who may benefit now and not have to wait for years until further testing is completed. I hope there will be coverage so that people can access the treatment, not just wealthy people, but everyone who might benefit can access it. That's unclear right at the moment. And the other exciting thing is that having this treatment, this first one, and hopefully there'll be others, is that we're going to be in, uh, incentivized to diagnose Alzheimer's early. So not wait till dementia is well developed or, or has progressed, but trying to catch it early and starting to treat and modify the disease early. And hopefully we'll get data that's encouraging to go even earlier in people who are building up plaques but are cognitively normal. We don't have that data yet, but that would be fantastic. And then we could focus on prevention. So that's what we do with other diseases. That's what I'm hoping we're going to be doing with Alzheimer's. And so that's why I think the totality of the evidence with all these, this class of drugs favors the accelerator approval.